Hey everyone, uh, my name is Thomas and um, a few years ago actually with a bunch of friends we had the idea of making the internet a friendlier place. How so? By enabling peer-to-peer -peer communication everywhere on the internet. Where everywhere before we had unilateral communication from site owners uh, to, the, to the web servers, uh, suddenly we wanted to have peer-to-peer -peer communication everywhere on the internet. So for that we developed the Hey product which is actually a browser extension um, that sits on top of every website and uh, offers you a chat room depending on the URL you sit in. So you can actually chat with all your friends and all peers that are on the uh, same website as you are. Uh, so actually we had this idea quite some time ago and then uh, it's only recently actually, one year and a half uh, ago that we thought, okay, what about actually including the blockchain in this product so we make it even more transparent. So we use the blockchain to actually reward users uh, when they provide meaningful content uh, to the platform and also to actually share the value that is created via the platform because we sell contextualized, contextualized ads uh, in, in the chat and actually the users uh, get a share of uh, these advertising revenues thanks to tokens. So we decided to embark on this journey of creating a social network on the blockchain. But oh my, you might know about the challenges linked to that. So we basically were faced with four key uh, challenges. The first one was about throughput. So, you know, how do you deal with the huge amount of transactions that you get when you have dozens of users uh, all uh, interacting at the same time with each other? Uh, we know today that uh, Ethereum uh, scales with up to uh, 20, uh, 30 uh, uh, transactions per second. Uh, that's definitely not enough for your use case. And then uh, user experience. You know, if you want to build a social network, it's not a one-player game. You need like dozens and dozens of users to make this a meaningful experience where you interact with plenty of people. But to get this mass adoption, you need a good UX. And UX is always, you know, clashing with security and blockchain is very secure. So how do you make sure you have a UX uh, like that is uh, friendly enough that, so that many people come uh, and join your network? And then what about volume? If we start storing all the content of the posts, etc., et then we're going to hit like a, a storage costs very, very high. So how do we deal with that? And then actually, last but not least, this creepy challenge of compliance. You know, the regulatory environment around blockchain is still uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, undefined. And um, there is still no clear framework in place to say, uh, to say actually who should be responsible if hate speech, for example, is ever recorded on the blockchain. You know, hate speech has got to be removed promptly uh, on Facebook, for example. Otherwise, uh, Facebook is held accountable. So we wanted to make sure that we would never be accountable for things that users actually would post on the blockchain, uh, on, on the content. So we were faced with these challenges and after quite some uh, thought process, we, we came up with uh, two, uh, two solutions, uh, thankfully, for that. So about the throughput and UX challenges, we decided to resort on a side chain solutions. So I don't know if uh, uh, some of you uh, here in the room know about these uh, little fellows. Probably, like, if there are Ethereum developers uh, within the room, uh, you've seen them. Uh, they are actually the crypto zombies. So we decided for our side chain technology to use technology provided by Loom. Uh, they are great guys, so they were first known for crypto zombies, so a series of tutorial about uh, how to learn uh, Solidity, and, developed, and they've developed this uh, whole technology of uh, their side chains to support, actually, uh, gaming and social kind of uh, use cases, so which were, like, the perfect fit for what we're trying to do at Hey. Uh, and then next to that, talking about volume and compliance, this actually forced us to focus on the so-called minimum immutable product. You know, when you're building something on the blockchain, you don't want to put all your feature set, like all your architecture and systems on the blockchain. You want to make sure you actually uh, use blockchain only for what it's best at. So we really focused on, you know, identifying what it is that has to be made immutable so that things are open enough, so that the user trusts us, en trust us enough, but at the same time, you know, we make sound architectural choices. And that's how we actually ended up uh, only storing um, like the uh, ultimate uh, uh, output, uh, output of a uh, user's interaction resulting in value creation. So let me explain that. We've decided not to store any uh, content from the users uh, on chain. So we do not store posts, we do not store uh, comments or whatever. We do not store username. All that we store is actually, you know, uh, interactions that occurred between these users. So for example, Alice is giving one like to Bob, and so actually uh, Bob will receive uh, one, uh, one uh, karma, one token, uh, and this is stored on the blockchain. But 
nothing about the content. So the storage requirements are way lower, and actually we uh, also work around the compliance issue uh, linked to that. So to uh, give a, a little more insights about uh, Loom, so the sidechain technology that we are using, uh, they're really great. So they're, they have a team of uh, nearly 100 people now, uh, uh, worldwide, so doing uh, plenty of exciting stuff. So their uh, sidechain technology is basically relying on a, a Tendermint protocol, so using delegated proof of stake uh, with so-called uh, uh, validators, so they are the miners of uh, this, this kind of uh, protocol. Um, and then they basically uh, uh, run uh, the Ethereum virtual machine, meaning like all the folks that have learned to code on Ethereum, you know, using Solidity or Viper and stuff like that, they can actually uh, take the contracts and just deploy them on, uh, on Loom. It goes like that, it's super easy. So you have all the stack with Web3.js, etc. So really great for, for us, there's a huge uh, developers community. Um, and basically they're focusing their technology for the use cases, as I was saying, of gaming and uh, uh, social networks. Uh, so for example, actually the very first uh, use case for the Loom sidechain was a delegate call. So you can think of delegate call as a kind of a stack overflow, uh, specifically for uh, things related to, uh, to Ethereum. And the cool thing with delegate call is that it's running fully, fully on the blockchain, like even the content, etc. Um, and it was a bit the, the, the laboratory of, uh, of Loom. And uh, one of the great things actually that they've done with uh, this delegate call and that we, we plan at some point to do uh, on Hay is actually you know, writing uh, smart contracts directly in Go uh, and then uh, compiling them and having them included, embedded directly in the binary of the chain. Meaning like really uh, all your uh, things that would be normally interactions with smart contracts using uh, you know, uh, yeah, like smart contracts interfaces, suddenly they become embedded in the very uh, fabric uh, of the chain, making it uh, way more efficient and, uh, and secure, actually. Um, so that's, you know, an alternative for people that uh, code well in Go and they are not so much at ease using Solidity, they can actually uh, use uh, that, that cool language uh, that Go is. And so uh, we've decided to use them and, you know, we thought about our architecture. Um, don't worry, anyway, it's unreadable. Uh, we won't go through uh, all the boxes on that, on that diagram, but uh, basically, what I would like to highlight here is that in our architectural choices, we really have this, uh, had this mentality of you know, minimum immutable product. So you see, like, there's uh, shitloads of business logic uh, everywhere, like all these uh, microservices, etc. But the interesting thing is that actually there are very few things uh, put on chain. So uh, here you have a few smart contracts on the main chain, so on Ethereum. Uh, you have uh, mainly the, the, the token contract. And then on the side chain, so on Loom, you have, a, again, the token contract and then the, the Karma contract. Karma is like a, on Stack Overflow, the reputation that you can ultimately exchange for tokens. But the interesting thing is that everything around is not on-chain, but we make sure that this is the part, you know, that users, we know they care about, is that once they have earned a reputation in Karma, uh, they are sure that it won't get, uh, you know, uh, stolen. It's fully uh, transparent. Um, and actually, you see a lot of arrows. Uh, and namely arose in between the side chain and the main chain. So why is that so? That's because, uh, uh, you know, in Hay and also Delegate Call and uh, or other uh, use cases, uh, what you have is that uh, users will actually want to transfer assets, so tokens, for example, uh, ERC20 uh, or 721, uh, from main chain to side chain and then from one side chain to the other, etc. And you got to have this interoperability of uh, the chains uh, between uh, each other so that they are really, uh, really usable. And so that's why a lot of arrows and actually we're very lucky in uh, the case of Hay because we don't have to rely on a very uh, complex uh, constructions to be able to have this interoperability of uh, chains. Because uh, probably you know about uh, Plasma, Plasma Cache or Plasma Prime or all these uh, you know, very advanced research projects that have the purpose of moving assets from the main chain to the side chain and back to the main chain. And it's all very complex because you gotta make sure that when a user actually trusts uh, the side chain owner uh, to move an asset from the main chain to the side chain, it won't disappear in the side chain, making it uh, unusable on the main chain. So there's uh, really a, a risk for users when they you know, transfer assets to a, a side chain that they lose their assets. So that's why a plasma cache has been, enfin, plasma has been built, and it's actually a fairly uh, intricate intellectually. Uh, but we're very lucky actually because here we rely on a, like 
a very stripped down version of, uh, of Plasma, uh, where uh, actually we only need to care about users transferring assets from the side chain to the main chain. So that is, users will actually gain reputation, karma, tokens on the side chain, and we basically, you know, uh, offer offer these tokens, uh, offer these assets to them, uh, thanks to their uh, activity and contributions. And then what they need to do is actually be able to redeem these assets on the main chain. And so they need to, uh, to bring them back. But it's not like they, they need to go from the main chain to the side chain and then back to the main chain. So only uh, assets created here and then transferred there. So let's take a little look at uh, how this works. Uh, it's called the transfer gateway pattern, something uh, that Loom has been uh, pushing forward and open sourcing. So really doing a great, uh, great work on, uh, on this. So how does it work? Basically, let's say uh, that uh, this user, uh, Alice, uh, has earned uh, karma and tokens on the, on the side chain. And then uh, she wants to actually redeem them so that she can trade them you know, on any exchange or with friends on the main chain when they have real monetary value. So what Alice will do is actually, uh, on the side chain, she will uh, burn her tokens you know, and, uh, and actually have a proof that you know, she, she locked or, or, or burned these tokens. Submit them, uh, submit this proof to the validators, so the, the miners of the side chain, and the validators will verify the claim that the, the tokens are, are frozen, and emit a withdrawal message that is signed by them, by one of the validators. Give it to Alice, and then Alice, with this signed message, will actually head to the main chain, and provide this signed message from the validators to the transfer gateway. The transfer gateway will be able to, you know verify that it was signed indeed by one of the addresses of the validator. And if only this is true, then actually the transfer gateway will release the equivalent amount of uh, tokens uh, on the main chain account of, uh, of Alice. And so what we have is basically an exchange of signed messages from one chain to the other. And that is kind of the magic that makes uh, this, uh, this transfer possible. So uh, thanks a lot for your uh, attention. I hope you joined the, the conversation on the uh, HiDot network. Uh, the product is uh, in beta version on the Chrome, uh, Chrome Web Store for now, so hopefully see you there. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Hello. Um, Hello. So first of all, I'm very impressed by your uh, approach to scalability. Um, I think that this is how every decentralized application should be built. Thanks. Um, also props to using Loom. Um, and my question is, so karma has a value, right? And have you thought about how do you ensure that a user cannot CBO attack the actual network and just like earn karma using a bot or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very good question actually because uh, I did not mention explicitly that on the Loom sidechain you don't need gas actually to perform transactions. Yeah. So you can do, you know, thousands of transactions per second. Uh, but of course, gas is there for a purpose, is to reward miners, that's one, but also to prevent CBIT attacks, so really people spamming the network. And how is this prevented? It's actually in the very fabric of, uh, of uh, you know, what Loom is building. They have this built-in uh, reputation system where you need to kind of, uh, you know, warm up your address to, uh, to begin uh, being able to, uh, to send a lot of transactions. So you have this built-in kind of reputation system that uh, uh, ultimately allows to, uh, to, to block and, uh, and ban people that are spamming, uh, spamming a thing. And then next to that, actually, we have a kind of oracle in place uh, that, makes it, that makes sure, actually, that people cannot uh, reward each other with karma, et cetera, uh, you know, on the high smart contracts if they have not previously registered as you know, uh, users uh, of the network. So it's not like anyone can, can begin spamming the network uh, like mad. Yeah. They have to be registered. But it's an ongoing field of research. I know, uh, like Loom is uh, spending a lot of time actually uh, having all these reputation system in place to avoid spamming. Uh, okay. Um, how do you consider identity or maybe some uh, proof of identity? Yeah, yeah, there was this question uh, there in the back about using, uh, you know, like uh, uh, identity providers on chain. Uh, definitely, it's on the roadmap. Yeah. No, I'm not very familiar with Loom, but you said that you use standard mint and delegated proof of stake. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a, uh, it's a, a permissionless network, if I understand correctly. Yeah. How do you uh, how the contract on the main chain is going to verify the signature of a permissionless network? Because if you need to know the validators and validators can uh, be added all the time, then that that contract cannot store them. Uh, all. 
Yeah, so the, the, the question is about how do we, uh, ultimately, like the ability to transfer assets from the side chain to the main chain comes down to the transfer gateway, so this recipient on the main chain, being able to validate that the transfer transaction is well signed by a validator. Uh, so how do you actually deal with the governance of making sure that uh, like these validators are legit and are reflected? Uh, and actually, uh, there it's actually, uh, like, uh, how to say, uh, the way that it's working now is, uh, 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 firstly, Loom has been running 100 validators uh, fully internally, okay? Only these ones were like validating, so no issue. And now what they are doing is actually, you know, onboarding uh, every month actually new validators, and all these validators, uh, all these nodes, actually they belong to uh, companies uh, using, uh, is, you know, using uh, Loom and their technology uh, as, uh, yeah, and, and so basically uh, supporting the technology by becoming a validator. So it's not like anyone can, can enter the, the, the validator network. And these validators, because it's important to mention actually, are being rewarded uh, with, uh, with tokens, etc. And the, the monetary value uh, ultimately comes from uh, the developers of uh, uh, applications, so Hive, for example, uh, renting this network. So it's like, uh, you know, blockchain as a service, really. Good. We have maybe time for... Thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question. You said, so basically, users get reputation, and then they want to exchange this reputation for uh, tokens yep. to eventually sell it. But why people will buy those tokens? Yeah, uh, so that's in the uh, economic model, if you wish. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, hey, is a company, right? Uh, we got to make a living. So the idea is to uh, monetize the, the attention of the users, uh, but in a very explicit way. So putting actually uh, ads uh, on the network, and these ads uh, have high value because they are uh, hyper contextual, you know, to the URL, to the URL. Uh, and basically, advertisers to benefit from ads, they pay with the token. So it's an, a utility token, and that makes you know the, the velocity of the market where they will buy ads from the users, and so users will have incentives to contribute good content so they can sell back these tokens. All right. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Right, so we're gonna put the mic. It's already on, so if you talk, people will hear you. And then you should connect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please. I don't know what I heard. Okay. 